Good morning, Saida. Hi, John. How are you doing, Ashish? Oh, absolutely fine. Okay, uh, so you're going to screen share. Uh, good morning, Saida. Hello, Dr. Bennett. How are you? Good, how are you? Uh, you Thank know Ashish. Ashish. Yeah, okay. I'll that. welcome. Are you, are, you, are you going to give me, okay, like you're going to give me the link? Uh, uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll share my screen. Is that okay? Yes, hold, on. Good. Hold, hold on. You want to share just it? Before, Go ahead. Just before we begin, I would like to ask you both how you both. Oh, absolutely fine. Thank you so much. You went to the theater last night. I'm sorry? You went to the theater last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. What'd you see? What'd you see? Uh, well, I think... Uh, what was it? What happened? Hey, you, you, know, you know, Ashish, your sound doesn't seem to be very good. Oh, okay. So yeah, let me. A, do you agree, uh, Saida? Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, you're clear, Saida. Okay. But Ashish, you're Wait. kind of muffled. Okay. You, do you have some other audio or microphone device? Hello. That's better. Is that better, Saida? Yes, it is. You're going to take charge, Saida. You're going to say, hey, come on. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> Don't yell. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, share my desktop. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. You want to show me? You want to you wanna do it or you want me to do it? Let me try. Let okay, me just... yeah, that's good. That's good. We got time. The promo machine promo machine is already set up. You ready to blast out to Facebook and the mailing list uh, and the link to this webcast on YouTube in the in the email. But are you on the email list, Saida? Uh, sorry, Dr. Bennett? Are you on the email list? Um, we, we have an email list where we send out. You're gonna, please text me your email address. All right. Not, not now, but sometime. Okay. 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 Uh, John, Go ahead, Ashish. 
Uh, I think I have already. Yeah, I think is this the one? Yeah. So now I think. Can you see? Yes. Go ahead. Can you? You have the sound enabled. Go ahead. Play it like you're going to play it. Okay, you don't have the sound enabled. Okay, what you got to do is screen share again. Okay, get off this screen share. And leave, leave it totally. How do I do that? Uh, so. How do I do that? Is there, a, it should be a, at the top, stop screen share. Yes, there is. Stop okay. share. There we go. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Now. Okay, when you, okay, let, let me show you. Okay, I'm going to screen share. Yeah. I'm, I'm pressing screen share. And this first screen that opens up, at the very bottom, it says share sound. Okay. So I can't this, see your screen. Okay. No, no. Go, you go ahead and or go ahead and uh, open your screen share and okay. don't go any further. Okay. You see at the bottom, it says share sound. <coughs> yeah. So I'll click that. Click that. Okay. Okay. Now okay. And save that. And now and screen, open, screen share I'm, now. And, and we'll optimize test for video clip as well? Yeah, yeah. We want to test the sound. Right, Saida? Okay. <laughs> just, say, just say, yeah. We were then introduced to fiber optics in the 1960s, uh, loop magnifying Okay, you got the audio now, uh, but I don't have this. But in fact, the, the progress we made with the illumination did not translate. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can. I still remain quite. I'll start large. again. If you look at the yeah, I can see it. I can see the screen. I can hear it. Okay, can you go back to the beginning again and do it? Do it again and start because you're going to kind of coordinate it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So get off so the screen share. Get off the screen share. Okay, start again. You're going to have it preloaded, ready to go, or? Yeah, so okay. I clear from here, right? Okay, okay, very good. Okay, now share the, share the screen completely. You're not sharing the screen completely. There, there. Okay, That's, welcome there everyone there to is. Neurosurgical Perfect. Team. Is that okay? Yes. Great. So. You want to start that, start the sound at the beginning. Okay, that's all right. Uh, so, we gotta... okay, let's go let's go one once again okay go so ahead. share screen uh, i do this i share it i play okay welcome everyone to neurosurgical tv it's a there great honor to once beautiful. again present here beautiful great so and it, and uh, we got to be honest. We got to say it was taped. I mean, uh, I, no, I know no, absolutely, that, absolutely. Yeah, well, I know that some people try to get away with throwing. I've said I've seen the videos, and I know they're not live. So no, no, I think no. we have uh, to be honest. And, no, no, and, we'll, we'll be absolutely honest. And uh, what uh, I and Jayesh have planned is we'll we'll start with Jayesh, so that the ball gets rolling. Yeah. Jayesh is already prepared, so uh, I'll just ask him to join. Okay. Uh. <coughs> okay, I got to do some promo work, uh, Saida, okay? Oh, do you know how to admit people, Saida? I'm going yeah. to make you co-host, okay? Sure. sure. sure and Ashish okay. also. Uh, well, there you go. Please admit the people, okay? Because I got to do some promo work.
Uh, just hold on. Yeah, hi, uh, John. Yes. Uh, Jayesh is there. Can you just uh, pick him in? Yeah, Saish, uh, Saira, are you, are you, can you let him in? Do you know how to do that, Saira? I guess not. Okay. Uh, I guess I, I, I'm trying. I think I can do it. Okay, well, okay, I'll do it. Uh, yeah, Jayesh, we are just taking you in. Okay, here we go. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to Jayesh. I'm John Bennett. Hello, hello. Uh, and this is uh, Sa the moderator, Sayeda from uh, Pakistan. Could you introduce yourself, Sayeda, please? 
Yes, yes, Dr. Vanishwar. Hello, uh, hello, hi, hi. Dr. Good evening. Hello, hello, Dr. Jayesh. It's really nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. I, I'm uh, Sayeda Mishra Shvak. Uh, a lot of people call me Sayeda, and a lot of people also call me by my middle name, Mishra. So it's really up to you what, that, what you call me. I'm recently uh, doing my intern here in Pakistan um, at a really a good university, one of the best universities in Pakistan, uh, Dawa Medical College. You might have heard about it. And uh, I'm really, really, really into neurosurgery and uh, I really hope to become one someday. Nice to meet you too. Oh, she's uh, nice enough to moderate. Okay, go ahead. You know how to screen share and everything, right, uh, Saish? Yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Saida, for a wonderful introduction. And I would like to grateful, I'm very grateful to Dr. Asish Tendon for providing this opportunity. Uh, am I audible? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, okay, you're you, speaking Dr. first, Jayesh, right? So right, are right. we starting? No, 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 I'll let you know. No, not for five minutes. <clears throat> okay, five. we still have five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. uh, how? Uh, I, I think let's start with uh, Jayesh. That would be great. Okay. I yeah. agree. Get it rolling. <coughs> yeah. And, and so I'm going to introduce Saida. I'm not even going to be on the screen. I'm just, I'm going to go 10, 9, 8, 7, after 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hi, I'm Saida from Neurosurgical TV. Okay, Saida. I'm a medical student from Pakistan at Dow Medical. And uh, it's, you know, it's, an honor. it's a pleasure to broadcast uh, this and describe the, the webinar. And I'd like to introduce uh, Ashish uh, and introduce Ashish. Yeah. Well, pro and appropriate, appropriately, you know, he's a neurosurgeon from Dharata uh, and uh, he's part of this group. Okay. Okay, Saida. What is and, the uh, how, how do you pronounce that place? Can you be there? Oh, it's Jabalpur, India. You you can just say Central India. That's what I do. <laughs> some of those Indian <laughs> some of those Indian names drive me crazy. <laughs> it's just Central India. Don't worry. Uh, Doctor okay. Ashish, uh, should I share first and then chat something? Uh, there, yeah, yeah. Why don't you come. share? You check it. Check it right now. Let me check it. Yeah. So, uh, you don't have any videos, do you, uh, Jay? Yeah, I have. I have videos that that is within the. Okay, let's uh, test the video. Let's test the videos. Yeah, yeah. To make sure the sounds okay. So this is my, uh, my okay. This is my okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It looks good. Go to the video. Yeah, this is one of the video. Is it clean? It is smooth. Yeah, yeah. Very good. No, is there sound to that or no? No, 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 no sound. Okay, okay. No, that's no problem. Yeah, that's good. It, it's very good. It's good. It looks good. This is surgically surgical video. I'll, uh, create a less MB, less than 100 MB, so that it will re, uh, try. Yeah, that, it. that's very good. I think that's right. one of the best I've seen. <laughs> I mean, it load, loaded fast. Yeah. So, fine. So, it will be enjoyable. Okay. Okay. So, I'm ready. Great, great. So, I, I think we are all ready. Okay, I'm going to take you off the screen here because, uh, you know, yeah. I'm going to introduce your face. Yeah. So, uh, uh, John. Yeah. Uh, what I'll do is uh, after Saida introduces me, I'll just have a few slides on uh, the fusion, on interbody fusions. Well, well, you know, don't even tell me. It's your show. Once, yeah. once she introduces <laughs> you, you do what you want. It's, yeah, uh, and I don't get get in the middle. You yeah. run it. You run it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. However so you fine, want. Fine, fine, fine. I'll take over. Don't you yeah. worry. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I'm not a neurosurgeon. I really can't direct the flow of neurosurgery conversations. You know what I mean? <laughs> so 
I'll leave it to you guys. Uh, okay, one minute. Okay, say so I just count down and then you start. Okay? All right. Yes, sir. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, <coughs> 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our uh, Minimally Invasive for Brain Spine Forum, um, brought to you by the Neurosurgical TV. I'm uh, Dr. Sayala Mishra Shwab, and uh, I'm a medical student in uh, Pakistan, uh, at Dow Medical College, and uh, I'm your host for today. So I'll just go ahead and introduce Dr. Ashish Tandon. He's a neurosurgeon in India uh, from Central India. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Ashish, do you want to say something? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Saida. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, I think this is uh, a restart of our. Uh, Minimally Invasive Brain and Spine Forum. So on behalf of the forum, I would like to invite all the speakers and participants for today. Uh, as our theme in the past has been, please feel free to question. Uh, you can, you know, if you do not understand any part, uh, you can even interrupt in between if you feel that it's very important. We don't mind that. Uh, the scheme of things for today would be, uh, it, it would be approximately an hour of your time. Uh, I'll be starting with uh, interbody fusions, just a few slides, about eight or 10 slides. Uh, thereafter, uh, Dr. Jayesh would uh, take over. He would be speaking on uh, OLIFs. And uh, finally, uh, Professor Charles Teo would be speaking on the evolution of uh, craniotomies. So let me uh, start with uh, lumbar interbody fusions. Uh, it, can you all appreciate the screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So uh, unlike the cervical spine, the lumbar loading uh, is very different and the loading is maximum in the front, through the body and not the posterior elements. So whenever we need to fuse it, we need to see that we fuse the anterior elements uh, so that the loading is proper. And that is why we give so much of weightage to interbody fusion, especially in lumbar spine. And in this regard, we have a variety of uh, fusion techniques, which includes the very first, which was uh, posterior lumbar interbody fusion, which included placing two cages uh, from uh, each side. Uh, but that... Uh, uh, involved retraction of both the roots. Thereafter came a T lift, wherein uh, we removed the joint on one side. The root on the other side was not uh, stretched, pulled. Even on the ipsilateral side, the root was just uh, sort of protected while uh, the cage was uh, is being pushed. Uh, there's also A lift. And the latest in uh, the whole scheme of things is uh, OLIF. I personally uh, am a T-lift man, so I combine uh, miss uh, screws with T-lifts. Uh, T-lifts as such uh, obviously provide anterior column support with circumferential support and improve fusion rates. Uh, so before I hand over uh, the subject to Jayesh, uh, this is one of the latest uh, comparison. This is uh, almost published in uh, 2021. It's a comparison of 
oblique lateral interbody fusion with uh, minimally invasive transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion for treatment of lumbar degenerative disease. And what it says is that compared to Ms. Tlif, Olif showed almost similar results in terms of patient reported outcomes, the restoration of SLA and the fusion rates. However, there were superior results as far as restoration of the disc height was concerned and the lumbar lordotic angle was concerned. Also, the operation time was less, the estimated blood loss and length of hospital stay, and the muscle damage was uh, much less with uh, OLEF. Uh, however, the complication rate with OLEF is higher than MISTLEF. Finally, it does not bring persistent and substantial damage to the patients uh, with the, all these uh, increased complication rate. So this uh, publication was as uh, late as uh, 2021. Uh, so with this, uh, I would uh, like to uh, pass on uh, the stage to Jayesh. Jayesh is an, uh, a young and dynamic uh, spine surgeon from uh, Lucknow. He's practicing. He's an associate professor uh, from uh, SGPGI, Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute. It is a, a huge hospital uh, bang in the center of uh, central and north part of India doing uh, fantastic work. Uh, he has interest in spine, MIS. Uh, he has a lot of work in uh, craniovertebral junction. Uh, just uh, about, I think, a month back, we were together and I saw him and uh, Professor Bihari's work uh, for uh, CVJ. They've developed an instrument for joint retraction. I was fairly impressed uh, with it. Uh, uh, so, Jayesh, uh, we are extremely excited to have you here for this uh, forum uh, talk. Uh, please see that uh, you stick to your time and uh, we welcome you once again uh, for your talk on OLIF. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Asish Tandon, for this invitation also and your wonderful introduction. And uh, hello, doc, uh, Dr. Sayada. And Dr. and James uh, ba John Bennett, thank you uh, for this uh, exposure and the opportunity to for presentation today. Let me share the yeah uh, visible my presentation. My presentation is visible. Uh, yes, we can see it. Yeah. Yes, yes, we can. Sure. So, so this is uh, about, uh, I would like to talk to you about uh, the lumbar interbody fusion mainly and uh, mainly minimal invasive uh, olive. So as uh, Dr. Asish described, uh, there are uh, four type, uh, mainly three, three way to do a lumbar interbody fusion. Post, uh, so in, during the evolution process, it was started with the PDF, posterior lumbar interbody fusion, in which they have done uh, laminectomy and fusion from both the side, but with gross retraction of the nerve root. So definitely T leaf. It, it came uh, the T leaf by follies and harms. And T leaf is about only facectectomy and fusion from one side and decompression to the both the side. Till date, of course, T leaf is the standard method. A leaf is the anterior lumbar diffusion uh, in between the great vessel. There are specific indi indication to the ALIF that uh, particularly mainly useful for uh, alpha S1. Now coming to the lateral approach. So the lateral approach, it was started with a uh, capnar that is by uh, lateral number body fusion via SUAS muscle. So it's a trans SUAS approach. The only issue uh, and the literature complication of ALIF suggests that the lumbar plexus lies within the SUAS muscle and it is a trans SUAS approach. So there were a higher rate of uh, lumbar plexus related injury. So the most recent, recent approach by Mayers came uh, into the picture that is oblique lumbar interbody fusion. An idea is to do lumbar interbody fusion anterior to the SUAS. So it is a true minimal invasive approach, a true minimal invasive way to do a lumbar interbody fusion. 
uh, in anatomical sense because like SCDF, there is nothing in between. You are directly reaching the entire body area and do a discectomy and do, doing the fusion. So it is a really sought after method. And uh, it's very important to know when to do. And most important is when not to do the olive. So suppose if you have, if you are uh, this, the, the, the situation in which you have to choose between the tea leaf and olive. So when to do the olive. So any grade one or two instability due to spondylolisthesis or any case of uh, instability in between L2 to L5 level, olive would be better. L5 S1, of course, it is a newer method, but it, it is still not standardized at that level. So olive is restricted to up to the L5 above. For high gate listosis, of course, it is not uh, recommended. Spine deformity for coronal deformity correction, coronal curvature correction, it would be the wonderful procedures. Any patient of instability who already has been operated for adjacent um, for fusion and then again presented with the adjacent segment disease or failed back, syn uh, back syndrome, it is a uh, literature wide, it is a best fusion rate. And uh, of course, a fresh approach. So it's a good alternative for failed back syndrome and adjacent segment disease. Now, when not to do, we should uh, remember that the olive, the principle is jack, jacking up the disc. So increase the disc height by jacking up the disc. It's an indirect decompression method. So anything which requires direct decompression, like the severe canal stenosis due to extruded disc or hypertrophic ligament of phlegm or the facet joint hypertrophy, in which if you think that there is a direct decompression required, it is not indicated. Clinically, you must know that uh, the indication of olive is when patients have a predominant back pain or the radicular pain, which should be relieved by rest. So if patient have a predominant rest pain, a radicular pain, which is not relieved by rest, the outcome of olive is relatively not good. So you should remember that uh, clinical indication. Now, any con uh, uh, the situation where the anterior assess is contraindication like history of retropetonal surgery uh, or vascular anomaly that we should, I, I, I will talk to you later on that, how to uh, rule out the vascular anomaly in which it is relatively contraindicated. Osteoporosis, of course, the subsidence rate by, uh, by indirect decompression is high. So for osteoporosis, yes, Philip should be chosen. So these are the indication and contraindication. Now coming to some interesting uh, anatomical aspect. So first I would like to explain you the graphical way how to do the olive, what are the anatomies of the retropetonal approach. So once you become uh, well worth with it, then we go for uh, one surgical example and uh, various techniques and steps of the surgery. And then we'll go for complication and some interesting case presentation. So the olive is about, about the minimal invasive retropatonal approach via anterior abdomen in between the major vessel and the suas muscle. So uh, it is basically done in right letter decubitus position, always from the left side. And uh, the idea is to go from this three abdominal muscle after splitting the muscle by lateral abdomen with the help of blunt finger dissection, all the peritoneal content with the retroperitoneal tissue and the fat, you should dissect and push it anteriorly. So idea is to push it anteriorly till you can uh, access this oblique approach. So with the help of this fingertip, with the fingertip, you can assess and uh, touch the suas muscle, you can identify it. And then you, you can dissect the interbody space area, you can identify under c arm. Then once you reach the inter body and disc space area, you can place the olive retractor directly over the targeted area and then you discectomy and you put a cage. So that is this is all about the olive. Now, what are the some anatomical structure which you should know exactly because you need to preserve it. Uh, so you should be well worth with retro peritoneal aspect, uh, the, the anatomical air. Things. So most important is a lumbar plexus. So lumbar plexus is lies in the posterior half of the suas plexus. You should remember it, the posterior half of the uh, suas muscle. So there are two uh, heads, anterior and posterior heads. So all the lumbar plexus lies in between the head, within the muscle. Only the genitofemoral nerve, which, which is exactly 
uh, starting from the L2 and then it is closed at L4-5 uh, level at the mid space. So that exactly need to be taken care of and it should be preserved and you should uh, gently make it posteriorly. So you should retract it posteriorly and you should preserve it. Ureter, ureter automatically will push anteriorly by blunt finger dissection. It always remains safe without any issue, except you are working at L2-3 higher level, which need to be preserved. Sympathetic chain, sympathetic chain lies in the, both the side of the uh, vertebral body and anterior half of the disc space. So you should be take, uh, take in the mind that in anterior half of the disc space, there is a sympathetic chain and it sh should be moved anteriorly. Of course, there is a communicating branch will, which will come into your picture. It can be sacrificed without any issue except some percentage of patient may have transient lower extremity symptoms because of that, but there will be no neurological deficit by this communicating branch. The most crucial structure is the larger uh, vasculatures. So you should remember anatomically that the outer bifurcate at L4 body, the lower border of L4, and the IVC bifurcate at the lower border of L5, and to the both sides of common iliac vessels. Now, exactly before we move to the surgery, we should know the level of bifurcation because sometimes the higher bifurcation Yeah. So exactly the level of bifurcation, you should know the, the iliac vessels and the distance between the psoas muscle is very, very important to know. It should be minimum one centimeter. And sometimes you got a high level of bifurcation in which this left iliac vein or the iliac lumbar vein may encounter in your uh, surgical territory and it need to be preserved. These are the large olive cage and this is the POX plate you can directly place over the interbody disc space. So idea is to do a obliquely complete discectomy and then you put this uh, larger cage into the disc space. Now for supplemental fixation, either you put a patient into prone position and you do a percutaneous pedicle fixation from the posterior, or you can place this directly, you can play, uh, place this pevox plate over the disc and with the help of two diagonal screw into the directly to the body, you can fix it. So it's like a SADF. And this is oblique fixation. Usually I prefer this oblique fixation, it is very fast and uh, recovery would be wonderful. So this is the basic idea about olive. Now let understand the whole the procedure uh, by some one case example. This is a 60 year male patient with a back pain with a bilateral lower limb radiculopathy since one year. Of course, patient doesn't have a rest pain. The, the, the pain, neurogenic claudication was 50 meter, but after that patient improved. The patient had predominant uh, back pain without any deficit. X-ray suggestion of grade one spondylolisthesis here. Uh, no coronal deformity, it's very important to rule out the scoliosis also. And the idea is to do L4-5 olive. So MRI, which is suggestive of uh, minimal canal stenosis, you should always rule out the hypertrophic ligand of flavum and the facet joint. You should always exclude the severe canal stenosis. And uh, this case is good for olive. And uh, here we can see there is a minimal canal stenosis and the pseudo disc collapse. Now, before uh, you choose the case and uh, in every patient a day before surgery, you should uh, go to console and see the Excel MRI. So olive is done to always from the left side. So Excel MRI to be seen starting from the L1, L2 level and it, the vessel should be traced up to the L5 level. So three. So one important thing is the suas muscle. Here is the suas muscle on both the side. So mainly left side, you should check the suas muscle. You should see where the lumbar plexus lies, usually in the posterior half. You should know this thing. This is the iliac vessel. This is a large aorta and this is the vein. So we can see here that the aorta is bifurcated into the two common iliac vessels here. And this IVC is bifurcated into two vein here. So naturally, compared to right side, the space between the vessels and the suas muscle is more in the left side, which is natural. That's why one of the reasons left side is preferred. And second thing, this is the area of interest here. 
this distance should be minimum 1 cm the left iliac vessel and the psoas muscle if it is less than 1 cm it is relatively contraindicated that should be ruled out clearly uh, always we should uh, all surgeon would like uh, would like to play the thicker arteries than the you know fragile ivc that is one of the more reason the left side would prefer the position so always uh, right lateral decubitus position uh, it should be draped at the chest level at the pelvis level now everything the incision should be marked under fluoroscopy so l4 body and l5 body and l4 5 disc space is marked in this case now you should mark the intervertebral disc space exactly the midpoint of the disc space and your incision came exactly 4 to 5 cm anterior to the uh, this midpoint of intervertebral disc space now if patient is it's variable if patient is uh, heavy or uh, fatty then you should come more anterior now it's depend uh, practically i would prefer two or three finger two or three finger with uh, anterior to the midpoint of the disc space that would be enough now three to four centimeter incision parallel to the disc space would be enough you can place oblique also if you are doing two or three level uh, one more important thing is uh, how much you flex the table usually initially i've started my practice that i would like to flex the table but uh, there is some disadvantage of flexing the table. The advantage of flexing the table is that if some, if if suppose in initial learning curve, if you are uh, working with the high iliac crest, that facilitate your oblique approach. But the at disadvantage is the suas muscle get into spasm, and you may have a postoperative issues also. And sometimes there is a neuropraxia of the lumbar plexus also. So usually, I prefer rather than flexing of the left leg so that uh, the suas muscle would be relaxed. These are the some important considerations. Now, this is the video, the technique of the olive. So, three to four centimeter incision would be enough. It should be parallel to the disc space. Then the layer wise, the muscle should be split. First is external oblique, then internal oblique, and then transversalis abdominalis. So, once you open the transversalis abdominal fascia, you directly land up with the retropatinal fat. You should be more and more posteriorly to avoid an adherent entry into the peritoneum. Then you use your uh, blunt finger, which always is better. Uh, you, with the help of blunt finger, all the retropatinal content should be pushed towards the anterior abdominal wall very gently till your fingertip touch the psoas muscle. Once you feel that, then you can push it anteriorly till you can feel the body, L45 body. Once you can easily uh, identify the intervertebral disc, then you can take a microscope also and you can see under vision, you can use handheld retractor. Now, once you feel that you are um, uh, exactly uh, uh, at the body level, intervertebral disc space level, you can use this prop. And uh, because every, all, all the steps is going, being under uh, 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 fluoroscopy, this prop should be, this is very important to identify the entry mark. So the, your initial prop should be always uh, in the anterior half of the disc space. So if you divide into anterior one third, middle one third and posterior one third, your prop always should be either in the anterior one third, that is a wonderful, that entry for the oblique trajectory or in the, in the middle one third, never in the posterior one third. So this is the entry point, you should confirm. Then you use all the dilator one by one up to the maximum 22 uh, dilators, 22 millimeter dilator, which is the largest and sequentially you dilate it and you place the MIS retractor. Here excuse, it is- excuse, excuse me, doctor, you're not sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah, you're not sharing the screen, yeah. Yeah, uh, here, uh, uh, again, I-, I, I the screen. Yeah. Yeah, John, I can see the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just me. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, go back to what you were doing. I couldn't see the screen on. The... It's funny. Is it okay? Uh, because, no, you uh... can share the screen now, Jayesh. We were there with you. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. Now? Yeah. yeah yes, yeah. yes. We can see. Go ahead. Now. Okay, okay. So... This olive retractor, this is the last final dilator. This should be in the anterior half. 
This is anterior half because the posterior half all contain the psoas muscle and the lumbar plexus. So this is very important. You, you are directly over the disc space. Now the next step is this is the olive a lateral mass quadrant retractor. For TLIF, we are using that is a posterior uh, mass quadrant retractor. This is a lateral quadrant retractor which should be directly placed over the disc space, targeted disc space. Then this, uh, this is fixed via two pin directly over the body. I usually avoid the lower L5 pin because there, there is a chance of injury to the ileal lumbar vein. Then you take a microscope once you fix it and a vision and this is uh, exactly the disc space. You remember that uh, uh, you need a 1.5 to 2 large anilotomy. The large anilotomy is very important because it gives you a space for the thorough and complete and discectomy under vision under microscope. And second thing, it give you a it facilitate you to follow a complete menu, uh, maneuver, orthogonal maneuver and instrumentation. It's very important to do a large anilotomy under vision. And of course, thorough discectomy. So uh, the most important part of the procedure is uh, end plate preparation. So there are two parts. One is a soft, soft cartilage and one is a uh, bony cartilage. So for soft tissue cartilage, you, you need a various kind of severs. You rotate it and remove the disc and clear it. And for hard or bony cartilage, you just need to rub it by this kind of ring curate. It's, it's most important, avoid aggression and you balance between, you know, complete uh, end plate cartilage should be clear. So it's automatically aligned them. So now this is a very, very important shift. Contralateral anatomy. You can use one large saver. You can give a blunt push uh, for the contralateral anatomy because it helps in completely align the uh, sagittal curvature. It, it's helping completely align the curvature. Even grade two uh, listhesis, you can easily reduce with this contralateral anatomy. Uh, but it should be cautioned. The next step is a trialing. So this is a trialing. Uh, this space is sequentially distracted with the trials. And under fluoroscopy, you should see that you can achieve the one level above or the normal level disc height. So, so practically, your, uh, your target is one level above or one level below. That is a normal disc height and foramen. This trialing should be done under fluoroscopy. You are putting this into the anterior half or the middle half of the uh, uh, disc space and one very important maneuver this orthogonal maneuver you should remember that every instrumentation you are pushing pushing obliquely into and then you should be parallel to the disc space and that maneuver is the orthogonal maneuver and that is the reason your retractor should be parallel to the disc space it should be the, the, the blade should be parallel to the disc space so it allow complete orthogonal maneuver and your spinal canal and foramen remain uh, intact So this is a, the orthogonal maneuver. Your idea is you put a cage in the anterior half or the middle half of the disc space. Depend on the lotus you require. There is a 27 millimeter cage. I usually prefer autograph and mixture of BMD and got wonderful result by that. And this cage placement being also done under the fluoroscopy. As you, you should start uh, two, two centimeter obliquely, and then you do orthogonal maneuver and you push inside till the opposite kind of end plate. This coronal view is very important while pushing the cage and the vision that the four marking is very important. Two center marks should be exactly at the level of spinous process. And this two lateral mark should be exactly at the level of end plate. So this, once you put, put the cage, now you have two options. Either you do a po conventional posterior pedicle screw fixation by turn of the position, or you can directly place this Piox plate, which is av available with, uh, directly over the uh, disc space and the cage. It's same like SEDF, same like a cervical SEDF. And then you use two uh, large screw. This, uh, this is a screw available 25 to 50 millimeter and variation length and you directly put in the diagonal into the body and you fix it. So this is a post-operative image. You can see the this is uh, done by oblique fixation. And uh, because you haven't entered in the posterior canal and that those nerve root and the dura, and so of course, uh, no bony damage at all. So patient can be discharged on day two or day three. 
There will be no pain. Uh, only for uh, the lumbar scoliosis can also be corrected, uh, two level, three level, whatever, pedicles for fixation. And similarly, grade two listhesis can also be reduced by the olive. Uh, now, long-term outcome, why I'm showing this? Because, you know, if you are, uh, uh, you have a, maybe you have a controversy that we are putting the cage or a, a pivox plate anteriorly. So what happened the long time, whether it is, working or not. So this is a 2.5 year and approximately three year follow up. We can see there is a fantastic fusion, which usually started in four to five months. That is the advantage of olive because we are giving the largest cage in, into the body and just need a little bit support. So it's worked well. Multiple level olive. Yeah, it gives a leverage of complete elasticity of abdominal screen, uh, abdominal skin. So by moving it just a once five centimeter incision, you can have a two or three level of olive. Uh, this is an example of 52 year female operated for L3 for fusion 10 years ago. And then see again, uh, operated by posterior approach. And then he again, she presented uh, with the backache and neurogenic claudication and uh, X-ray suggestive of, you know, instability one level above and one level below. So either it would uh, require a posterior long exhausting revision surgery or you can do a single incision and you know like this l23 and l45 fusion by the same same incision and so adjacent segment disease fell back uh, segment disease for revision surgery it is a wonderful approach of course the neuro navigation used in the olive i hope uh, there's a significantly reduce the radiation exposure and timing also and increase the accuracy is one of the some some of the literature uh, recently i published the neuro navigation guided olive and its experience and uh, this is the book in which uh, we have summarized all the steps uh, in, in in detail uh, coming to the complication of olive so the most common complication we encounter is a pain in parasthesia at the just a medial part of thigh you know patient complain of numbness at the middle part of thigh, uh, remain just one or, one or two weeks. Temporary suas meekness in many patients, uh, maybe because of breakage of the table, or sometimes you, if you, you are retracting suas muscle more for uh, if your procedures being uh, continued for more than two hours, then you may have a suas weakness sometimes. All other complications are very, very uncommon. Major vessel injury, segmental vessel injury, less than 2%. Sympathetic chain injury, less than 2%. And uh, the cage of subsidence, yes. I want to talk about the cage subsidence, a very common complication. Uh, one of uh, this very uh, interesting patient, 53 year male, uh, grade one listhesis, I operated for L profile listhesis. And patient uh, have done well and patient discharge with uh, symptoms reduced, all the back pain, radicular pain. But on six month follow up, he again present with a similar complaint. So in CT, uh, I find out that uh, there were a cage subsidence and the cage pull out also with screw pull out dislocation. It, it, it got revised into TLIF. But what I learned, the cage subsidence is a very, very important phenomena. The most important thing is cage selection should be very wisely while you are doing tri trialing intraoperatively. Your uh, lateral, the, the size should be preferred that your lateral part of the cage should exactly at a parallel to the lateral end plate. This is very, very important because if your cage like TLIF or other procedures, if your cage is lying the center part of the end plate, so it, it, it is beneath the cancellous bone. So there is high chance of subsidence. The only and extra advantage of all is that your cage is lying exactly the strongest part of apophysis. So the chances of subsidence is less. You should prevent over distraction, protect the cortical part of end plate during the uh, preparation. Uh, this is the way to prevent the subsidence. And of course, osteoporosis is relatively contraindicated. Now, uh, this is something new, reverse pedicle surfixation. Yeah, we can say that if you are putting the key, uh, fixing the cage from anteriorly with a smaller screw, there is no three column fixation. So if you put in the similar way in the pivox plate, the upper screw. I'm sorry, Jayesh, uh, how much time? 
Yeah, just the last last slide. Yeah, it's fine. I'm okay. just finished. We need some time for discussion as well. Hundred percent. So this reverse pedicle superfixation works well, and uh, so what are the advantage of olive? Uh, this is also the literature wise. A uh, better segmental load dose is five to six degree, and in some paper, of course, uh, compared to the tea leaf, which is two to three degree. And as Dr. Asis uh, also shown the studies that you may have a similar result with that. Large size of cage and graft placed in the enter column, so fusion is very uh, early and in 100% down the line of one year. Definitely preserve the posterior column, muscle band, you are not dealing with the uh, dura and the nerve root, so it's the posterior related complication and pain is uh, very, very minimal. Your cage is placing in the transverse position at the end plate, so very, very less chance of subsidence. And if you are using a pure plate, standalone fixation, fusion rate is comparable to postural, although RCT is recommended. So thank you, thank you. Uh, this is about the olive. Sorry if I uh, take more time. No, no, absolutely. You finished bang on time. Thank you, Jayesh. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll uh, quickly go on to the questions. Uh, Dr. Amjad Saeed has already posted one. Uh, he's asking how many levels can you do by one incision? Yeah. So with the, with if the the only thing is you can go three level. Of course, three level is difficult for beginner. But yes, two level is very easy. You can do two level olive. You should start even L two three, L three four, or L three four, L four five. The only you should remember that L five S one should not take into account. If you are using a multiple level olive, alpha S1 should not take into account. But yes, three level olive can be easily done by the similar incision, except you need to use the elasticity of the skin. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question. Can you do lysthesis correction by this olive? I think this has already been answered in his presentation. So yes, it can be corrected. It can be corrected. Uh, if you have a greater list, grade two list, this is the contralateral anatomy is more important. So with the help of blunt pusher, you should break the annulus of both the side. Once you do that, once you remove the cartilage, then even grade two list, this is can be easily reduced. Even better, I can say with the anterior approach. Okay, great. Uh, uh, any more questions? Uh, from the audience. Okay, so I have a list of uh, questions uh, that would uh, further clarify the procedure. Uh, let's quickly start. Uh, any anesthesia consideration that you would suggest? Yeah, mm, exactly. I would say uh, there are number of patients in which I found uh, fluctuation in the blood pressure fluctuation uh, in, in sometimes, you know, uh, the rate and it's a picture is similar to sometimes like arrhythmia and like that. Then I came, found that uh, probably I am, uh, you know, playing with the sympathetic plexus and the communicating segment around the suas muscle. So what I started that if you, if, if you are found that blood pressure is fluctuated, fluctuation, so you should uh, keep in mind that somewhere sympathetic chain is compression. So what I prefer, or the lumbar plexus, what I prefer, I use a 10 ml uh, adrenaline, 5 to 10 ml adrenaline, then and I, I just inject it into the suas muscle. Okay. And and the operative area, it's really helped me sometimes, you know, you have sometimes a fluctuation of the blood pressure is, and the uh, pulse rate becomes subside normally. So that is okay. the only anesthetic consideration. Otherwise, it's okay. Nothing okay. special. Fine. Um, uh, what about uh, obese patients where like obese when i say obese uh, where the bmi is uh, almost about 28 30 really obese patients yeah definitely uh, then really obese patient um, it, it it is challenging it's challenging because of two factor one is uh, your olive uh, uh, the, the lateral quadrant retractor height is you know it's 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 kind of one of the limitation that is number one it is very difficult you know, you are using your blunt finger dissection uh, to reach the suas muscle. So what I find the challenges is in a more obese patient, you will find more difficulty to reach there exactly. So two, three things you can do. One, as uh, anti-abdominal patient, you know, your, your incision should be more bigger. 
despite of uh, apart from the finger you can use a handheld retropatern retractor that's available in your uh, you know divers you said yeah yeah and the under diva. microscope with the small divers you can reach by dissection and slowly and then under vision you can do the procedure that is what you can add on in the in the otherwise the once you reach the inner body disc space everything is same okay fine now um, in case if you have to put in uh, screws the pedicle screws so do you go in for routine screws miss screws what do you do yeah definitely if uh, uh, i have started the things with the posterior pedicle screw fixation only uh, always it's uh, posterior percutaneous pedicle screw fixation only because even you are dealing with a grade 2 lysis or grade 1 lysis if you put a olive cage it means you have already aligned everything so there will be no issue while putting a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation this even even a two or three level so i definitely change the position make it prone and then do a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation except in last one or two year i find that the pivox plate the oblique fixation more comfortable for me and a uh, very rarely i do a percutaneous pedicle screw now i i use that pivox plate direct oblique fixation from that okay now um, the question here is that like, like we have had uh, ample number of reports that uh, you know and there have been few comparisons also between single level uh, or single side pedicle screw versus you know double side pedicle screw so two screws versus four screws and uh, you know the four screws have stood the test of time and uh, obviously the cortical strength of pedicle screws outweighs these screws here so Definitely. you know they are just two screws bulk of them are cancellous screws so what what's so two screws most of them being cancellous screw so what's your experience and what's your take on it yeah initially uh, uh... definitely theoretically we can see theoretically if you are putting a two cancellous screw especially around 30 mm to 40 mm there is of course high chances of uh, cage subsidence and chances of displacement would be there but i did not found i did not found that except in one patient i have shown if during putting the screw cancel uh, in the uh, so two three things you should keep in the mind the screw should be long enough not 25 30 40 it should be at least 40 45 mm i try to put uh take i uh, in recently i have started to take a pedicle opposite side pedicle in 15 mm screw with the help of navigation or you know cm technique that that is what uh, the, i i show on the concept it's reverse pedicle screw thing and second thing the second thing during putting a screw if you feel doubt about that that you know it's it's, it's consistency is not good uh, purchase is not good i definitely use a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation posteriorly in in okay. every case okay uh now what's the duration of surgery in just just with this system that you showed and olef plus uh, mis screws yeah uh, if if you use this uh, after discectomy if you put a cage directly or the plate on oblique fixation then it, it's just 9 uh, 1.5 hours average completely and if you of course turn it then one hour extra to you know turn up the position and then you directly put a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation it takes a long but long average time. even mine and even literature wise it's around 90 minutes to one uh, one point for uh, only only okay now um, yeah, i'm sorry yes sir to ask you to suggest we have two questions um yeah. one one in the chat box and the other other ones in the q and a you guys uh, did you guys see it yeah yeah, yeah. we've already uh, answered those two questions both of them yes uh, dr agatella wants to ask uh, that uh, this thesis can this thesis be corrected by uh, tlf Yeah, we have answered those two. Say that we have answered those two questions. We've taken them. Those There's three questions. There's another question too. Do you see the three of them? Any chance of implant implant intra body place? 
do you see those questions by Harshad Parekh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, how about the second one? Can you do lysis correction? Was that answered? Yeah. Okay, yeah. how about the next one? How many levels can you do by one incision? By Amjad Saeed. That too. Yeah, that. that was answered. Okay, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the uh, uh, one of the questions to Jayesh was, uh, um, from where do you get the autograph? Yeah, so uh, iliac crest, that is a direct answer. Uh, usually, actually, uh, our incision is nearby iliac crest. You know, if, uh, if of course, the umbilicus we use for L45, that is not far from the anterior uh, iliac crest. So we can use the elasticity, elasticity of uh, leverage of the elasticity of the abdomen and you can you know, manipulate. Maybe sometimes you need to extend or another incision. Otherwise, I use same incision and I can take a graph from the iliac crest and I mix up with the uh, DBM or BMD, whatever available, depend on you know uh, economical status of the patient. And with some blood, uh, DBA, and uh, photographed like iliac crest, you give a wonderful result. Great, great. Uh, perhaps uh, I think we've had most of the questions answered. Uh, Jayesh, we would be extremely thankful to you if you could just uh, write down your email ID in the chat box. Uh, yeah. th there are participants who may want to you know, discuss with you directly. Uh, they may have questions in the coming days so that they can, you know, sort of contact you directly sure, sure, uh, if, if they have any questions. So if you could just uh, put in your uh, email ID into it. There's sure, one sure. more question there, uh, Ashish. Uh, yeah. By Harshad Parekh. Do you want to ask, ask that directly, Harshad? Yeah, yes, sir, please you, come. Introduce yourself, Harshad, please. Maybe he's not coming in. Let me get, to, okay, I'll ask a question. Do you see the question there, Saida? Oh yeah, do you, do you use artificial bone graft? Yeah, they already answered. Oh, I'm sorry. And once again, I'm making a fool of myself. Okay, no, no, sorry no. about that. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, I already told that I used a mixer of both autograft as well as artificial graft. Okay. So I think, um, uh, okay, there are a few more <laughs> questions here. Uh, Any instances of dural injury? If so, how to handle by Raghavendra? Yeah. So actually, uh, if you are going retropaternally uh, as an oblique approach, and uh, if you use your instrumentation in the and the orthogonal maneuver very proper way. So it means you are bypassing uh, your posterior column, you are bypassing the spinal canal as well as foramen. So it that is, uh, I, I would say contraindication, means you should strict yourself into the anterior half of the disc space. Direct decompression, Nowadays, we can say it's possible if you use an endoscope, you know, you can do a direct posterior part of foraminotomy and discectomy if you take an endoscope, but I would say it is a contraindication. You should strictly remain with the indirect de dural decompression, so no chances of dural injury in olive. I haven't encounter encountered any cases of uh, dural injury, so... That, so uh, there's one more question. Uh, what about grade three listhesis? Yeah, grade three listhesis, it means uh, usually grade three listhesis is presented with, you know, severe canal stenosis. Second thing, grade three listhesis uh, usually, you know, have some kind of anterior or element of facet, facetal fusion. Uh, if, you, if you do a CT from the high grade listhesis, so these kind of uh, high grade listhesis is absolutely contraindication for indirect decompression because you need to see that you need to play with the facet joint and the vision you need to you know dislocate it from posteriorly to the better idea so grade 3 contraindication for olive okay okay 
I, I think we have had uh, most of uh, the questions answered. Jayesh, we are extremely thankful to you for uh, uh, sparing your time and uh, sharing this uh, uh, valuable uh, uh, lecture on uh, our forum on uh, OLIF. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, if uh, everybody is ready, we can uh, go on to our next lecture. Uh, we have uh, Charlie Tio. He has sent, unfortunately, he his flight has been delayed. And so uh, there were some, some issues with his flight. Uh, and uh, he's, he's gone to South Africa, perhaps. So uh, he has sent his uh, recording and I would be playing it. Uh, so let me just go on to it. Let me share my screen. Uh, where is it? Maybe Charlie's watching in flight. Sorry? Maybe Charlie's watching. Uh, maybe. Okay, welcome everyone to Neurosurgical TV. It's a great honor. We can't see the screen. You're not sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'll just share it. Okay. Just yeah. Here sure I am. Okay. Make it, make it large. Welcome everyone to Neurosurgical TV. It's a great Full honor screen, right? to once yep. again present. Okay, Good. so everybody can hear? Yes. Okay, so let's start. So this is a 15 minute uh, lecture, friends. Uh, it's from Charlie Center's recording. Present here. Uh, we've decided to run a series of talks based on uh, basic principles of minimizing craniotomies or minimizing uh, uh, neurosurgery of the brain and the spine. Uh, and uh, those basic principles will follow a set of rules that we'll start off with very basically and then, of course, build on that to show you how uh, it can be done with minimum uh, dam damage uh, and maximum e efficacy. The first of the series is the evolution of craniotomy to try and appreciate where we are now and how we've come to this place. So if you look back in history, in the 1910s, when Cushing was first starting neurosurgery, uh, uh, things were very, uh, resources were very limited. Uh, this is an operating room in those times, and you can see that the light source was essentially a, a candlelight uh, held above the patient. And in order to get enough light into the cranial cavity to perform the operation, of course, you had to do very large craniotomies just to get light in, if nothing else. In the 1930s, when Cushing had been in the specialty for some time and had uh, uh, used his uh, courage and some technology to improve craniotomies, he started using a headlight. That headlight was again based on a bulb, uh, which was collect connected to electricity. Uh, it was simply that, just a bulb, no loops, uh, just a headlight. And of course, with that improved illumination, he was able to reduce the size of craniotomies. We were then introduced to fiber optics in the 1960s, uh, loop magnifying uh, lenses. Uh, but in fact, the, the progress we made with the illumination did not translate into better or smaller craniotomies. They still remain quite large. And in fact, if you look at the literature, the craniotomies seemed to increase in size uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Yeshigal the then introduced the microscope to neurosurgery in the 1970s and 1980s. And despite the introduction of better magnification and illumination, uh, in fact, the cranial still did not decrease in size. So I guess to summarize, there was no change in the size of craniotomies from Cushing's time to Yazhigal's time, despite better illumination and better magnification. After the 1980s, we really became sophisticated with our preoperative imaging from very pixelated images from the CT scan. We then developed MRI scans in the 1980s. And now, of course, we have uh, super uh, resolution in terms of 
MRI scans showing 3D reconstructions, uh, etc. We now can combine those structural images with some functional images and even tractography uh, showing all the white matter tracks. And more recently, uh, companies such as one I'm a consultant for, uh, Omniscient, have developed not only maps of the white matter tracks, matter, uh, maps of also the uh, cortical oscillations. Intraoperative navigation improved as well from simple uh, neuroencephalography to encephalography or ventriculography. Uh, and then interoperative navigation, and more recently, of course, interoperative imaging in the form of uh, interoperative MRI. We can now even localize better than that with biological markers such as 5ALA uh, and fluorescein. In keeping with the progression and the technological advances we've made in neurosurgery, our anesthetic colleagues have also made huge advances. Uh, when I started neurosurgery in the 1970s, 1980s, in fact, the anaesthetic agents used increased the turgor and increased the pressure uh, of the brain. Uh, things like halothane and fluorine, isoflurane, they're all, uh, 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 they're, they're all these volatile anaesthetic agents actually increased the ICP. Uh, and oftentimes, just from the anaesthetic alone, you'd have a very swollen brain. These days, we have anaesthetic agents now that reduce the intracranial pressure and in, key, in keeping with that, uh, almost all craniotomies where we open up the dura, the brain is not bulging and in fact, uh, uh, quite slack uh, with a significant subdural space. Instrumentation has improved from bulky uh, uh, dual uh, armed uh, instruments. We now have single uh, shafted instruments, which reduces the clutter in these small craniotomies. And we even have hybrid instruments that has several functions in one. Uh, this has a CUSA, irrigator, sucker, and bipolar in one instrument. Hemostasis has improved dramatically, again, from monopolar to bipolar to non-stick bipolar, and more recently, hemostatic agents that, uh, uh, that can uh, reduce bleeding, especially venous bleeding, and even arterial bleeding by injecting or, or, or placing topically uh, hemostatic agents. This is me doing an endonasal case, hitting Batson's plexus, uh, doing a clivectomy. You can see some terrible bleeding, which all settled down just with a bit of hemostatic agent uh, sprayed on and then some uh, pressure to happy. Visualization has improved not because of just better illumination and magnification, but we also now can use endoscopes. And even the view from endoscopes has improved dramatically from this picture of the frame of Munro when I first started endoscopy in the 1980s uh, to the 2000s, and more recently, this high resolution images you get of the frame of, uh, frame of Munro, uh, which doesn't even compare to that that we, uh, that we had uh, 30 years ago. Uh, if you combine all of that, we have these integrated operating rooms, uh, such as brain speed and, and uh, one room, uh, and all these rooms uh, basically uh, gather all the technology together and combine it uh, to make our job easier uh, and uh, better for the patient. So in conclusion, there has been no change in the size of craniotomies despite technological advances that now give us better preoperative imaging, intraoperative navigation, both structural and uh, biological, better instrumentation, which reduces clutter, and, and better means of hemostasis. So before we go any further, I mean, you have to ask your question, I mean, really, is there a need for change? Some of the advocates of what I call maximally invasive surgery go, look, it's not about the cosmesis, it's not about the size of the incision, it's all about the neurological outcome. So if neurological outcomes are good, uh, why would we change? So granted, neurological outcomes are good in most of the cases we do, uh, but with honest reflection and auditing, uh, there are many complications that occur through collateral damage. In other words, not from taking out the tumor necessarily or clipping the aneurysm, but access to the aneurysm or access to the tumor. We all know that people with poor circulation, diabetics, hypertensives, atherosclerotics, uh, they all get ischemia of their flap if the flap is large enough. Uh, and that ischemia can lead to terrible complications that can sometimes be deadly, 
but it's not deadly. You can certainly increase the morbidity and mortality of the uh, uh, of the operation, such as CSF leakage, meningitis, wound dehiscence, etc. And wound dehiscence is not uncommon with large flaps and poorly vascularized skin. Cosmetically, we can absolutely do better. Uh, many of the operations we do in the terion region uh, create a lot of wasting of the temporalis muscle, uh, and that can cause pretty disfiguring uh, asymmetry of the face. So why has there been a reluctance to change? Uh, we're in the 2020s. Uh, we started introducing the keyhole philosophy People like Fukushima, John Jane, uh, all started introducing keyhole philosophies way back in the 1970s. So that's, 30, 50, that's 50 years, and yet the majority of neurosurgeons don't practice the keyhole philosophy. Uh, and a lot of it is basically because of dogma. Dogma passed on by our forefathers, passed to them by their forefathers. And those dogma, or well, the, ma the major dogma is the bigger the craniotomy, the safer the operation. And it's been very hard to basically teach the opposite to that, that in fact, the smaller the craniotomy, the least amount of damage that can be done to the brain and surrounding tissues. The other major reason for people being reluctant to do surgery through a keyhole is this whole safety issue of hemorrhage and how does one control hemorrhage. It therefore requires a different skill set. Uh, the surgeon needs to think about every case individually. No longer can you ask your residents to go down and do a standard uh, bicoronal flap or a standard terional incision, because you have to think about uh, all sorts of things to get to that keyhole uh, craniotomy. Uh, and therefore you have to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, and there's no doubt that it is harder for the surgeon because of this upskilling that's required and getting out of the uh, comfort zone. Uh, but why should you change? In other words, what benefits are there to the patient? Well, operative times are shorter, uh, therefore closing times are shorter, uh, less blood loss, less denervation and devascularization of the scalp, uh, better cosmetic outcomes. Now, this is a really important one. The less, the least amount of brain exposed, at least uh, the, the less the chance of damaging brain. So in fact, if you do a big craniotomy and have a big amount of brain exposed, you can lean on it, you can accidentally knock it, you can drop instruments on it. Uh, so if you can limit the amount of exposure of brain, it surely will reduce the risk of the operation. There is a low incidence of post-op hematoma that's been well documented in the literature. We published our results uh, showing that. Uh, and uh, because of all of these advantages, there are shorter operative uh, recovery times. So there is no doubt that a keyhole small craniotomy is better for the patient, even though it may not be better for the surgeon. So standard craniotomies, bicranial incisions, terrianal incisions, question mark incisions, they're a thing of the past, I'm sorry. And no longer can you ask your resident to go down just to a standard craniotomy. So how does one start doing uh, keyhole craniotomies? Uh, and this is just an introduction. We'll be going into more depth in the next series in this lecture. But to start with, I want you to think of two principles, the entrance and the corridor. And if you think of these two principles, you'll be able to uh, uh, ergonomically uh, and safe, safely uh, design your craniotomy. So let's talk about the entrance. There are two concepts with the entrance, the size and the location. We have been told to make big incisions, big craniotomies, a terional exposing frontal lobe and temporal lobe, even though you're going extra axial, uh, bicoronal with big incision, big craniotomy, even though you might be going subfrontal. Uh, so really, why would you need a big entrance when all you need to admit is a small person like that? And this is what really got me started on keyhole surgery. This operation was done by an excellent neurosurgeon from a different city in Australia, very famous, written all the books. Uh, the patient got recurrence of their tumour and came to me in Sydney and I thought, well, he's a good surgeon, I'll just reopen his craniotomy. So I reopened his scalp flap and lo and behold, I saw that in fact his craniotomy was significantly smaller than the scalp incision. So already, once you reflect on this and say, well, hang on, the skin incision really didn't need to be that big because you could have exposed that amount of craniotomy with a much smaller incision. I then opened his dural opening and saw that his cordisectomy 
uh, was significantly smaller than the dural lobe. So on reflection, the operation that was performed uh, by this other neurosurgeon could have been done through a simple linear incision and a small keyhole craniotomy with the same end result. So here's the perfect example of that. Large tumor, deep to the surface, so you don't have to expose the surface. In fact, anything that's two to three centimeters below the surface can be done through a craniotomy the size of your thumbnail because the angle subtended uh, from that distance uh, can actually reach uh, uh, significant depths uh, and width uh, uh, deep to the surface. So if you look at the long axis here, take it to the surface, there's your craniotomy and you can still achieve a complete and radical resection through a small craniotomy, small incision, no bigger than a burr hole incision with a good outcome. There are times, however, when the size of the entrance does have to be big because you have to admit a large tumor. And this is the situation where the tumor comes to the surface, a small craniotomy like this will not expose all the edges. And if you want all the edges exposed, such as that with a meningioma, then you've got to do a much larger craniotomy, which is still a keyhole craniotomy. Because remember what Panetsky taught us. And sometimes his whole lecture would be just two slides. The first slide saying, Keyhole surgery is a philosophy, not a size. It's a concept. It's a thought process. I think we have just received this much, perhaps. So, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll quickly discuss uh, briefly. Uh, do we have any questions here? Uh, I haven't looked in the panel. Have you been looking? Okay. The, can you look in the panel, uh, oh, Ashish? Sure. Do you see any new? Can I ask it? Yeah, there's a question. There's a question. Welcome, Uday. Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening, Dr. Ashish. Yeah, hi. Hi, sir. Sir, I want to ask about the size of tumor. It was previously told in his talks that the, I mean, the minimum uh, maximum you could do is the four centimeter tumors and the extension. Has it been evolved more? Can we take out more bigger tumors through uh, keyhole approaches? Okay, so uh, uh, the size of the tumor has no relationship to the size of the craniotomy. The relationship is. Uh, to the depth. So for example, if so, yeah, for superficial, so for superficial, if you have a three centimeter meningioma, you're gonna make a four or five centimeter craniotomy to excise the tumor as well as the dura. But if you have a five centimeter ventricular meningioma, or deep-sided intraaxial tumor, your craniotomy could be as less as one and a half or two centimeters, and an incision could be smaller. Also, for large six centimeters, seven centimeter sized uh, CP angle acoustics, the size of the craniotomy uh, that uh, can be fashioned out. Say, I would I would just go for a two and a half, three centimeters, and I have seen Charlie making two centimeters or one and a half. So but, what about, yes, sir. Yeah, but you know, uh, uh, there are a, a bunch of uh, uh, youngsters who would want to enter. See, keyhole again, as uh, Professor Perneski had also told and Professor Tio says, that keyhole is a individualized concept which evolves. So. On one hand, keyhole is developing, and on the other hand, the surgeon is also developing. So, for example, in uh, so for example, for me, a tumor can be excised by three centimeters. Professor Tio could be would be able to excise it by two centimeters, and my fellow here would be excising it by four centimeters. So that that it's a keyhole for him, for me, and for Professor Tio. 
and we all are evolving together also it also depends on the technology that you have at your center so we have to maximize the technology as well you know at those centers where there is navigation you can be more precise in centers where you do not have all the technology required you can you know so there are a lot of permutations and combinations which decides the size of the uh, craniotomy and incision i think the small craniotomy will be i mean the margins will, uh, there will be small venous congestion the margins also it's definitely better what i realize so uh, i'm what, sorry i didn't get your question i think the small craniotomy will be definitely better because there will be less congestion of the venous compression at the margins also less edema will be there that definitely better no 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 that is not the case see uh, mis is this is a very very important concept that all of us need to understand minimal invasive surgery and keyhole so minimal invasive surgery is a huge big umbrella under which keyhole surgery is a small part so minimal invasive surgery under that umbrella comes good anesthesia good pre op preparation perfect matching of even your monopolar your pre op and intra op anesthetic drugs your cerebral decongestants your uh, csf drainage etc etc each and every small thing constitutes mis your pain therapy because it is minimally invasive to the patient keyhole craniotomy is just a small part they do they are not one and the same thing they are different so what about the fellowship program you had i mean can you please tell about how to go about that With, yeah you know, i'll i'll uh, i'll give my email and i'll send my uh, secretaries and my current fellows detail uh, you should be able to contact not a problem thank you sir Uh, perhaps uh, dr harshad wanted to uh, comment i think he has written sir do you wanted to comment sir yeah ashish i was just listening to your discussion and also the gupta's talk uh, understanding and i have heard professor charlie to you many times uh, on this and again i i i personally feel it's not the size which matters a lot uh, to the excision of a tumor and how much you can you know give the maximum benefit of by the size optimum size is very important rather than going for a 2 cm size or a 1 cm size uh, it it really doesn't matter a lot in my experience Uh, even in a larger craniotomy we don't see so many post operative complications what uh, has been described so what is more important is that yes i i have found sometimes what uh, uday gupta was telling when the brain swells up and the small craniotomy small dural incision can hold your venous drainage and it can cause problem and then you have to do a lot of other maneuvers to reduce it can happen so optimum size i would put rather than a keyhole is very important to for any kind of a tumor many times in a meningioma in a keyhole if it starts bleeding we are stuck many times okay okay you increase the size of the craniotomy or a flap or a dural opening so that's one one thing i would stress i am listening to many people about this keyhole business and keyhole surgery it's wonderful to do that yeah it is a smaller incision smaller but it's very important to have an optimum size and optimum size will depend on each and every patient differently if this should tumor okay somebody can remove the big tumor through a small incision and sometimes you can be in trouble also so this is what i thought i would put it to across my view is that it should be optimum an optimum dep- depends on the every every individual patient is different absolutely okay. absolutely what, yeah and and what what i feel is it is a corridor and what i agree with you a deep seated tumor a small craniotomy you can go down because your incision down is not too big and very easily you can go through that but many a times it's difficult especially and sometimes when the brain is swollen is 
I agree with Dr. Ashish, uh, Ashish sir that I mean if yes. you make a small keyhole, I mean there we can. Yes, I agree. As the we are growing, retract less. I mean edema will be there and will be better off with small incisions. I mean that could help us. I mean cosmetically also and less pain retraction being retractorless also that will I think that's what Dr. Ashish is trying to say. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and and as sorry, as we are growing older, we have our our flaps have become smaller now. As with the, uh, what Ashish says, technology available like uh, you know navigation or so on, it becomes smaller. I agree with you. But we have to have an optimum size of the opening. Otherwise, something can be troublesome, very, absolutely. very troublesome absolutely. to get it. Absolutely. And, absolutely. Yeah. But that's not my person. No, no, it is. Thanks, uh, uh, it, it is uh, sir, in fact, uh, uh, I'll tell you my own uh, experience in uh, 30 seconds. For microvascular decompression, I was even presenting it. I started uh, reducing my incision. And over the last one year, I have increased my incision by almost uh, half to one centimeter because I found that I was struggling a little more and there was more cluttering of my instruments, more scissoring. So, uh, you know, I have just increased it uh, because uh, I, I was not very comfortable. So, you know, as, as uh, Professor Perneski and, uh, you know, the rest of them have told that, uh, you know, we evolve, we keep on evolving. Doctor, There's I one more. Uh, yeah, sorry, Jayesh, do you want yeah, to say? Yeah. Uh, the in between the discussion, uh, I, I also agree with Dr. Harshad also. Uh, the keyhole surgery is very, very you know evolving concept, and uh, the most important thing according to me is a consistency. Uh, the consistency and pathology of the tumor is also one of the important things. If you are planning for MBD, if you are planning for epidermoid. And if you are planning for highly vascular meningioma, three all are different things. So, of course, for, for that MBD, for the large epidermoid, keyhole surgery, yes, full marks. Large vascular meningioma and T2 MRI. And uh, even in surfacing, if you are planning a 7 centimeter tumor to excise with a 3 centimeter keyhole, of course, it will be, it would be dangerous. So, uh, one of the most important factor, according to me, is uh, uh, you know case selection. If you are doing case selection very right, keyhole uh, is the wonderful thing, and of course you should be uh, optimal rather than uh, more and more minimal invasive. That's just a my. Uh, one of the uh, questions is uh, any book to plan keyhole anatomically without navigation. You can. Uh, this is by Dr. Raghavendra. There are. Two very important books. One is by Professor Perneski and one is by Professor Tio. These two books are excellent books for uh, keyhole craniotomy. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, can keyhole cisternostomy replace decompressive craniectomy? Uh, anybody wants to take this question? Yeah. Yes. Uh... Jayesh, you want to, and uh, Harshad, sir, you want to take up? Both Harshad, of you can take up. No, please go ahead, Jayesh, go ahead. Yeah. We should have IP here, Harshad. <laughs> I have my own experience. So, but yeah, I have heard uh, uh, Dr. Ayip Cherian. He shows a uh, you know, wonderful result of uh, cistern of stomies and uh, uh, <laughs> definitely help in reduce the ICP and sometimes he may replace it may replace the uh, <coughs> compressive cranioplasty but I haven't my own experience so uh, maybe Dr. Ashish and Dr. Hatshat can add Yeah Jayesh I would say I agree system of stomach does reduce and since last 7-8 uh, years I have started doing system of stomach but believe me I don't have a guts not to do the decompressive craniotomy. I do both. I start with cisternostomy, so then I remove the bone flap, especially in a cases where you know decompression is very important. What happens, you know, you do a cisternostomy, even if you leave a drain, some CSF comes out, still you see a lot of brain swelling and compression, which is persistent. 
and this is my experience. So I have started doing both. I do both. I do open the cystinostomy. I open the cisterns and go and open and do a dural decompression as well as the bony decompression. I I'm, I'm, I don't have a guts to say, okay, okay, I'll do only cystinostomy and not to do a decompressive craniotomy. So this is my personal experience. Yes, I have heard I many times, and he is a great proponent of that. Okay, do only cystinostomy. Even my colleague, good friend, Professor Atul Goel. Tells me so many times. Oh, why are you removing the bone flaps? He he says I don't like it. I said okay, but my patients are benefited by that. This is my, you know, definite concept which I have been doing it. And cystinostomy plus removal, yes, definitely it helps. And I don't see any disadvantage of removing. It just adds one more procedure. I agree, but it is very helpful for a patient. and the results are wonderful if you do in a proper time cranioplasty they do wonderfully well this is my experience i i absolutely agree i think uh, as of now uh, we don't have those many uh, uh, comparative uh, studies to suggest that uh, you know decompressive uh, cranectomy has been replaced by cystinostomy and it is still the workhorse uh, be uh, it, it it is uh, you know one of my fellows i think it was uh, dr shinihas uh, he i think it was shinihas or mohit one of my fellows he just commented two or three days back that till neurosurgery would be there decompressive craniectomy would be there so uh, i i think it's going to stay uh well i i think if there, if, if there are no more questions it, it was uh so let me just comment uh sheed yeah. uh, i know that i turn would like to come on to discuss this uh with for regarding keyhole surgery so we we'll keep that in mind okay uh, yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely all of uh, each and every one is uh, invited and welcome on this forum uh i would really i'm extremely thankful to uh, all of uh, you for joining uh, especially the speakers uh, and the participants please feel free to even now if you have a quick question please unmute yourself and uh, you can uh, quickly ask or comment uh, you can also post uh, your comments on improving uh, uh, or uh, you know enhancing this uh, a lecture series uh, yeah. this is meant uh, for your own uh, benefit and we want uh, it uh, to be an established uh, practice uh, we we do have a question of uh, rag avendra has another one can multiple strategically place burhol cystinostomy replace decompressive cystinostomy decompressive cranectomy again uh, uh, the jury is still out on all uh, cystinostomy okay. and there are very limited uh, number of publications on this uh so we are still not very sure and perhaps this panel is not uh, experienced enough to you know answer this question ragwin perhaps some other forum uh, you can place this question i don't think so any of the panelist here is uh, experienced enough to answer this question of yours uh, sorry for that okay uh okay so if there are no more questions i'll i'll uh, i from my side i'm extremely thankful to uh, the speakers uh, jayesh charlie is not here to the participant can, can i just may i put a comment sir yeah yeah that please just just like uh, in surgery the open cholecystectomy was is now been just completely done laparoscopically and at single sin single port everything I mean, just like our flaps will definitely go on becoming smaller, and definitely because of less interaction of the brain, less tissue edema, less brain damage, will definitely go more minimal and more towards key. Oh yes, absolutely. There is no doubt about it, uh, and uh, uh, the technology is uh, changing, and we are also changing. Look at spine; everything is uh, changing, and uh, but. there's no doubt that uh, we are going to become more and more minimally invasive and there'll be other methods as well very good 
Okay, I think we can wrap it up, Ashish. Do you have anything else you want to say, or you're all set? Oh, yes. I, I think uh, I'm through. We've had, uh, perhaps we have extended by another 15 minutes. No, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. You won't get charged. <laughs> well, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to invite everyone in the panel, including Ashish and Jayesh, uh, to come to the Zoom lounge, which which occurs after this is over. Once this lounge ends, please copy the link I put in the panel for everyone. Let me, because it gives what, you know, you guys know the value of conferences. Networking is a big plus, and we need to bring that into Zoom. And we're trying to do that with the lounge. And let me just put the link up again for the people in the, and it's private. It's not going to be televised, so hopefully you can interact with the panelists and students, etc. So copy that link, uh, Ashish and Jayesh, uh, and anybody else that wants to come that can hear this that's in the panel, and we'll see you there. And thanks for a great webcast, Ashish. Thank you. We'll see you in the lounge. Copy that link. Thank you, thank you.